she's reviewing Ghadar's movie and she says it's as if a couple of movie crazy young French young Frenchmen were in a coffee coffee house and they've taken a banal American crime novel and they're making a movie out of it based not on the novel but on the poetry that they read between the lines. And when I read that, I was like, that's my aesthetic. That's what I want to do. That is what I want to achieve. <laughs> He was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1963 to a woman who was half Cherokee and half Southern white. She named him after Burt Reynolds' character Quint in Gunsmoke. They moved to Los Angeles when he was two and she took him to the movies regularly. When I was a really, really little boy, like, you know, four or something yeah. like that, I'd watch TV or movies with my uh, stepfather. We're watching some movie and he's, okay, Quint, you see that guy right there? It's Thomas Mitchell. He was the father in the original Swiss Family Robinson from the 30s. Oh, really, huh? And then we see some other, oh no, see that's Roddy McDowell. He's a really good actor, I like him, but he was a star even when he was a little boy. I actually thought, oh, well I guess that's what happens is when you get to be an adult, you become a movie genius. <laughs> <laughs> so I better start like, you know, preparing. And Quentin would go on to tell you who the supporting cast was, who the DP was. I just start putting films in people's hands and, and arguing my points why this movie was good or why that movie was bad. There was a whole aspect of me getting in touch with an audience beyond just myself of what actually worked with audiences and what they liked. You want to see three movies that if I were going to be like trapped on a desert island and I could go to video archives before I was going to get trapped on a desert island, what three movies I would take with me? One of the movies would be Brian De Palma's Blowout. John Travolta, by the way, gets one of the best performances of all time in this movie. And he just went into this, do you know what Francois Truffaut thought about you? Do you know what Pauline Kael thought about you? Do you know that how brilliant you were in the blah, blah, and this and that? And I'm, and I'm almost in tears now, thinking, well, yeah, but I didn't know what someone cared that much about all that, you know, and clearly he did. Right. He's like, look, uh, I think he's a terrific actor. I think what you should do is you should watch him and Brian De Palma's blowout, and if you don't think he's a terrific actor, then maybe we should talk about, should we do this movie together? He decided that there's only one person that can play that role, and that's you. And then he has to fight with the studio because they don't want me in it, but he only wanted me. Want to dance? No, 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 no. That morning, I got her and John together in a trailer. And I showed them the dance sequence from this movie, Bend Apart. All right, you know that little like with the three of them. And I go, that's why they're not dancers. They're not executing a dance perfectly. But for my money, they're the greatest dancers in the world. They're having fun. They're not dancing well, but they're actually dancing great because they're having fun. And I'm enjoying watching them enjoying doing the dance. That's what I want you to do. And they both got it. They just, once they saw that, they, they just, okay, I know exactly what you want, let's do it. When Vince Twist, I wanted him to kind of reach. <laughs> but when Mia Twist, the image that I had in my mind was the Zsa, Zsa Gabor cat from the Aristocats. And there's that one little scene where the Aristocats dance, and she's kind of like, <laughs> He's talked about how he loves certain scenes, classic scenes from other movies, and what he's done is just throw one after another. Ghadar is the one who taught me the fun and the freedom and the joy of, of breaking rules. You know, setting up a close-up on the back of somebody's head as opposed to, you know, and just fucking around with the entire medium. It's what it is, it's American vernacular, and Tarantino was able to listen to it very carefully. Because the dialogue is getting to be more carefully written, 
more character oriented and more interesting instead of simply being easily subtitled for the foreign uh, release. When a movie really, really does it to me, it's because it's, it's made me feel many different emotions during the course of it. And especially if I can pull off contradictory emotions. I want to play you as an audience. Oh, the fuck's happening? Oh, man. I, I want to be the conductor, and you're my orchestra, and the sounds that I make you to make, and the feelings I get you to feel, and then I stop you from feeling those feelings, and I give you something else to feel, and then I stop you from feeling that and make you feel something else yet again. Well, if a director can do that, if a director can pull it off, well, that's a real lucky uh, 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 audience member because you really had an experience that night. You went to the movies. <laughs> that was fucking trippy. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, there's a French director named Jean-Pierre Melville who came out in the 50s, did a whole series of, uh, of crime films, always like set in Paris or Marseille or something, um, that were basically the Warner Brothers Bogart Cagney films, all right, but completely set to this like French Parisian rhythm. But they do it with a whole different style and a whole different perspective, and here they basically reinvented the genre. I'm, I'm delivering the goods, but I'm also trying to, you know, reinvent it in a way. Quentin takes these genre elements and shifts them and in my perception raises them onto a different level. Yes, he does uh, utilize the genre, but that's not really what it is about. And in the western section we find Howard Hawks' Rio Bravo. This is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the another one of the greatest movies ever made. Ricky Nelson is so cool in this movie. I'll tell you what I'm a lot better at, Mr. Wheeler. It's mine and my own business. If you're really going to make the Western genre really work its magic, then you've got to do your version of it. Django! Django, have you always been alone? Django! Django, have you never loved again? I came up with a cool bit because actually Franco Nero's in the movie and it's a sequence where we actually have the two Django's in the same frame, both Jamie Foxx and Franco Nero. I have uh, uh, Franco look at him, look him up and down, ask him his name. Jamie says Django. Can you spell it? And then he spells the whole thing. And then after he gets through spelling it, I go, you know, I had not say, the D is silent. And then Nero looks at him and says, I know. <laughs> Little meta movie moment. <laughs> I'm not really a big fan of the art film western. You gotta still make a western first. So I, I'm actually proud that my films, the one, as, as, as offbeat as they may be, and my take on the given genre, they still deliver the goods. If you like a western, you might like mine. Since Quentin knows everything about every movie that's ever been made just about, there's references in the script to a lot of great shots. Taurus Bobo, when Yul Brenner walks up to a guy that gives him a smart aleck response, and Yul Brenner pulls the guy in the horse head. <laughs> from Wild Bill, there was a shot of a guy falling face first in the mud and not saving himself. It would be silly for me to try to do a John Ford type movie now. You can appreciate them, but as far as actually being a piece that goes out and entertains the world, they were made for a different audience. They were made for a different America. They were made, and particularly made for white people in the America of that time. You know, most of the Western directors that are really terrific all have their own version of the West. Corbucci had the most brutal, violent, bleakest West and, and surreal. And then using that fascist-led, bleak, barren, brutal, violent, surreal West as a jumping off point. Well, what is the true American equivalent of that? And that would be being a slave in the Antebellum exactly. South. So I wanted to do it like a like a, an exciting Western adventure. And it's a genre movie first that uses slavery and the Antebellum South as a backdrop in, in order to tell, their, tell this adventure. And the adventure that he was down with and I was down with is of a... a of a black male rising up, becoming a cowboy, becoming a spaghetti western hero, uh, becoming a folkloric hero, and goes out and saves his woman. She's in the, the pit of hell, and he's going to go and extract her from him. Yeah, he's a troublemaker. I wanted to give black males, and in particular young black males, a black cowboy hero. And not just a fancified one, he actually was a slave, and he started, and he was even doing it during slave times. And this is sort of like, you know, this is a western for you, this is a hero. I watched from my father, The Searchers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a 
dead and son movie. Yeah, to me, uh, Good and the Bad and the Ugly was my uh, uh, Western that was kind of the dad and son film. <laughs> After all the times I saved your life. I think the conceit of the film, which I think is fantastic, is Uma Thurman is Clint Eastwood in The Man With No Name. I mean, she's holding this masculine pose, and she takes this whole rule of the samurai all the way through this film. Well, it's your baby. It empowers girls mm -hmm. by the fact that Uma Thurman is a female warrior. She's a uh -huh. female avenger. Right. right? Revenge is like one of the classic staples in drama. Because what he does is take the other side of the feminine, the dark side, and puts it in foregrounds it constantly. She's not a victim. She's never a victim in this movie. I don't think Roots actually aged that well if you look at it. 30, 40 years later. The thing that really gets me about Root is you watch this whole thing that's on for 16 hours or something, and you're actually living the lives of these people and putting yourself in that place. And if you remember the, the last episode of it, Lloyd Bridges is one of the most hateful of all the racist guys in the movie, and has Chicken George, played by Ben Vereen, who's one of the guys that you've been following the most. At the end, they have Lloyd Bridges and they tie him to a tree and Chicken George is going to whip him. He's going to give him a peeling, the end all peelings. And you've been waiting 16 hours for this. And naturally, he does the thing that they normally do in these movies. Like, no, 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 I can't do that. That would make me as bad as you. And when he said that, all over America, a hundred million people said, no, <laughs> whip his. <laughs> he had it coming. He had it coming. It's about time for some payback. Yeah. Well, you don't have that problem in my movie. You get payback. <laughs> you get payback. It's really interesting that Quentin, being the product of the culture that made Western possible at all, where the, you know because the, it's the American West, of course, that Quentin would take the genre once removed into the Italian and bring it back to America. He takes like a double turn. In the Laserdisc section, we find the Criterion version of Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Frank Robert De Niro, Jodie Foster, Martin Scorsese in a little bit, Sybil Shepard, but no Harvey Cattell, which is uh, very odd because he's one of the he has one of the finest performances in this movie, as we all know, Sport. Taxi Driver by Martin Scorsese, Howard Hawks's Rio Bravo, and Brian De Palma's Blowout. If they share one thing, what is it? <laughs> I don't know what they share. I don't know either. Uh, other, you know what? Other than the, other, I guess probably other than a, a, a major directorial uh, vision. I started casting actors in Germany, and I wasn't finding anybody who quite had every everything that I needed, 100%. They could do the poetry in this language, but they couldn't do the poetry in that language. I literally had a moment where I didn't think I was going to find it. I can just tell you the day that Christoph came, walked in the room, sat down, and read two scenes i remember thinking and lawrence was sitting right next to me go we're making a movie and i think you know quentin uh, being a poet uses language to create so this character does the same thing when they leave out of the other war movies because in where eagles dare german is english and apparently richard burton and clint eastwood speak german so <laughs> magnificently great all they have to do is put on a costume and they can hang out in like the general's club forget about the fact i don't buy it it's also the fact that you've got possibly one of the most suspenseful sequences here but you're pissing it away by English being German. Right now, one of the things that's nice about this process right now is it allows me to be analytical, and I actually start seeing what it is I've done. So I took the scene where, where Mr. White brings in Mr. Orange to the warehouse, and Mr. Orange wants him to take him to a hospital. Seems like a very obvious scene. The very basic things, especially from where Mr. Orange is coming from, I'm dying and I want to go to the hospital. But just in writing those words, just all this stuff just started pouring out. Can you please hold me? That was when I realized it was a father-son story going on 
one and, and all these weird connections that happen later. I mean, just little things in the case of Reservoir Dogs, Mr. White keeps saying. When Joe gets here, it should be any time now. He's going to help you out. He's going to take care of you. What happens when Joe gets here, he goes to kill him. And Joe is Mr. White's version of a father and all this kind of stuff. So I finished it all, the writing this subtext thing about that one scene. And I go, wow, there's a lot there. That was a very interesting exercise. Now I never need to do that ever again. I don't want to know these things. I don't want to know it's a father-son story. I want to keep it up top. I want to keep it about the scenario because now I know it's there. When you go to a movie and you see a certain sequence, and if there is real cinematic power, and there are certain filmmakers out there that you feel were touched by God to make movies. It'll be a combination of editing and sound and some, usually it's like visual images connected with music or something. But when those things work and they really connect, and you know, an example could be the final gunfight sequence in The Good and the Band the Ugly. It's just like you forget to breathe. You are really transported to a different place and music doesn't quite do that on its own and novels don't quite do it and a painting doesn't quite do it. If you're in a theater and you're sharing the experience with a bunch of other people, ah, it's just, it's just truly, truly thrilling. I saw Quentin direct and it was the most exciting, exhilarating thing I've ever seen. He loves his actors. And there are only three of us in the whole scene. And he's focusing with delight on his face. I'm very lucky to have worked with some monumental directors. I mean, George Stevens, John Ford, Hitchcock. But I noticed about Quentin immediately. I had never met such a passionate young director. I think Quentin by his sheer outrageous going against the rules and making something exciting will stand out more than any of the people I've told you I admire. Now the violent intensity of Pulp Fiction calls to mind other violent watershed films that were considered classics in their time and still are. Hitchcock's Psycho, Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde, and Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Each film shook up a tired, bloated movie industry used a world of lively lowlifes to reflect how dull other movies had become. That, I predict, will be the ultimate honor for Pulp Fiction. Like all great films, it criticizes other movies. If you just truly love cinema with enough passion, and you really love it, then you can't help but make a good movie. When you're pleased to think, you know, that take really worked. That was great. He'd say, fantastic. Let's go again. And you said, what? He said, why we go again? Because we love making movies! An extensive understanding of Final Cut Pro X was absolutely crucial to this video. All the advanced editing softwares have a lot of tricks and shortcuts that take time to learn on your own. High quality tutorials are the perfect way to get started with new software or to really understand the more complicated parts of video editing. Skillshare has over 20,000 classes on countless topics from photography to business and they have an excellent Final Cut Pro class on the nitty gritty of editing on the timeline. The first 500 people to click on the link in the description below can get two months of completely free access to Skillshare. That's the Final Cut Pro X class plus thousands of others across cinematography, video editing, photography, marketing, and business. And while you're at it, follow me on Twitter at JackNugent27. Thanks for watching. And thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.